born even in the hell realm. So there we made the point that the point being made there is because the animal realm is associated with uh, confusion or ignorance. And therefore, uh, in this system, uh, Gyoba Rinpoche consistently will say, of the three poisons, the most dangerous is uh, confusion or ignorance. Uh, that it's at the root uh, of attachment and aversion. Um, and so then the implications of that, you know, like it's better to uh, like uh, have taken the vow and, and, in, and, and, you know, like um, circumstantial uh, reasons we break the vows, then at least, you know, we are not doing it ignorantly. We know, oh, that's a breaking of a vow. And so how much he values, huh? Uh, clear seeing over ignorance uh, and that ignorance is a silent killer so to say <laughs> we say you know smoking is a silent killer but ignorance is a real silent killer and so then in that discussion i remember some of us like you know like were concerned about our pets you know like oh they are how can we say that they are in a terrible state uh, and i said because they cannot make moral choices is the point being emphasized there but that's not the end of, uh, so here we saw, you know, the elephant, right, being hunted by uh, uh, these hunters. Uh, and even the elephant can generate uh, this thought, you know, that, oh, I'm going to offer myself uh, to the Buddha. And so, uh, so there are other, you know, like uh, clearly uh, examples, uh, especially in the Jataka tales yeah, where Buddha uh, or in his previous life as bodhisattva, or this or that stage, you know, there then it's different. Now we're talking about, you know, um, those who are already on the bodhisattva path, maybe third bhumi or fourth bhumi or whatever, for whatever karmic reasons uh, that have ripened, they are temporarily born as this or that realm of existence. Uh, so then it doesn't apply. Not doesn't apply in the sense that they are breaking karmic rules, uh, but doesn't apply as in they are more evolved uh, in, in their mind states. Uh, so, so whenever we, we uh, talk about like the faults or the disadvantages, uh, faults in that sense, the disadvantages of being a hungry ghost or, you know, being a hell being, uh, being an animal, uh, that is talking about uh, not those beings that are already on the boomies, uh, on the bodhisattva levels. Uh, we're talking about uh, helplessly being born uh, into those realms and not having accumulated any clarity. Yeah. So this point, uh, I point out here again. Mm. 422 is a very uh, interesting one. And I think um, even though the commentary is very short, uh, I think uh, we, uh, this is a very helpful one. So it says, uh, people claim that self-grasping is to be abandoned since one passes beyond samsara due to the absence of self-grasping. Mm. Uh, this statement, of course, you know, is uh, everybody like, oh yeah, of course it's true, you know, like uh, uh, we go beyond samsara when we have uh, finally been freed from self-grasping. And so, of course, you know, we have to abandoned self-grasping. Here, provocatively, uh, Kyopa Rinpoche says, mm -hmm. to deliberately grasp a self mm -hmm. and to gather accumulations. So maybe I will uh, modify this translation a bit. Uh, I don't know the Tibetan, but I, I, based on, I think, what the meaning of this is, is to say, to deliberately grasp a self in order to gather the accumulations is a skillful means. Yeah. Not and uh, in, the, in the sense of like two things, uh, grasping at the self and gathering accumulations is a skillful means. But to deliberately grasp at a self in order to gather accumulations is a skillful means or can be a skillful means. That is, in fact, it is, because now 
again to emphasize doing things with clear understanding and even if it is to temporarily grasp at a certain sense of self so this statement really points to i think a, a major problem that a lot of us have you know when we practice dharma and i've i've mentioned this i've taught this i've pointed this out and again and again uh, because i feel that many of us think oh buddha says attachment is bad buddha says uh, attachment to self especially is bad therefore we have to get rid of this buddhas are beyond self-grasping but we don't get to the point of Buddha by prematurely getting rid of self or self-grasping. The Buddha state is beyond attachments, but we don't arrive at the Buddha state uh, by uh, waking up one day and saying, okay, I'm done with all attachments now. <clears throat> no. In fact, it consists of skillfully choosing your attachments. Yeah. So I have people saying, oh, but what if you're attached to your Dharma practice? I say, oh, no, no, don't worry. You don't have that problem. <laughs> You'll be so lucky if you have attachment to Dharma practice. We're not there yet. Wait till you really have that problem, then we can talk about how to uh, overcome that problem. <clears throat> so here, <clears throat> the um, Chodra's commentary. Hmm? Hmm. Chodra's commentary. Yeah. Although self-grasping is the root of samsara, and selflessness is the means that liberates from samsara. To abandon self-grasping, <clears throat> it is a skillful method to gather the accumulations after first deliberately grasping a self. <clears throat> Just a side note, I don't like this capitalizing self and selflessness. <laughs> Generally, I don't like randomly using capital. <laughs> but I guess what Sobish is trying to communicate is that, you know, it's a particular kind of self. It's not, not just ordinary self, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I just have to show my uh, afflicted mind, my dualistic mind. Uh, so here, Chodra says, it is a skillful method to gather accumulations after first deliberately grasping a self. <clears throat> so what he means to say here is, even though self-grasping is the root of samsara, realization of selflessness is the way to be free from samsara, so in order to realize selflessness and abandon self-grasping it is nonetheless necessary at the beginning to deliberately to deliberately grasp at a self or grasp at a type of self What this translates to is this. You need to care hmm, that you don't want to suffer anymore. That is a form of self-grasping. Right? You need to care enough to say, I don't want to suffer anymore. So that is a skillful self-grasping. It is a form of self-grasping right? because it's based, still based on that you know, notion of like, I, I don't want to suffer. <laughs> you know? 
And it says, you have to care that much, you know, because there are people who go about their lives like, you know, I don't care, you know. And then they'll never get out of this mess. Just like in the next line, it says, you know, however, if one lacks that skill, the mere aimlessness of not grasping at any phenomena as the self is an aspect of delusion. So many people have this problem. The mere aimlessness of not grasping any phenomenon, any experience, any situation as the self is an aspect of delusion. This line is so beautiful and so important. Majority of this world is in this situation, which is a mere aimlessness of not grasping any phenomena as the self, meaning most of us don't even care enough, aren't even sensitive enough to the fact that there is a problem. So superficially, it looks like, oh, they are carefree, as we say. Oh, not a care in the world. Look how well they are doing. They don't even need the Dharma. They don't even need to practice. They're just going about their lives. Yeah, forever. You'll be in samsara. So that form of non-grasping keeps you. So however, one lacks that skill. If one lacks this understanding, the mere aimlessness of not grasping any phenomena as the self is an aspect of delusion. So this is warning us, you know, especially in your Dharma practice, you, you cannot be so, you cannot uh, be tricked by these superficial sense of like, oh, I'm not disturbed by <laughs> Don't be fooled by that. In fact, you should develop sensitivity to, uh, towards suffering uh, that, that on the preliminary level looks like you are grasping at self, uh, but you do it deliberately, meaning you know that uh, this is a skillful way to get out of this mess. So the analogy of prison that I like to use, you know. So the prison guards will come when they realize that you are about fed up and you want to leave. They will come to persuade you things are not that bad. In other words, they will come to take your mind off, right? The fact that you are in prison. And that is a superficial way of not grasping at self. Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's good. <laughs> so even, you know, saying things like, oh, samsara is nirvana. Prison is freedom. Freedom is prison. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, meanwhile, the prison guard, you know, hey, hey, another one kept in here. One less jailbreak to worry about. <laughs> so here, therefore, again, since grasping a self, which is transgressive, which, you know, is transgressive, that means it goes against, you know, at least on the superficial level, goes against what the Buddha taught, Therefore, again, since grasping a self which is transgressive leads to excellence, there is no need to mention the thing that is grasped as one's own. This line here, I don't really understand. Therefore, again, since grasping a self which is transgressive leads to excellence. So, I mean, I, I understand, you know, but uh, it's a little unclear why mm, Chodra wrote it this way. Basically, this line is saying, you know, since grasping at a, at, at a self, uh, which ultimately doesn't exist, yeah, can lead uh, to something good, then grasping at things 
as your own, things that do exist, at least on the relative level, can also be useful. And what does this mean? Next line. So next line means you can you know, help us understand this, this line we just read. One must also grasp such things as waters and flowers, which are not owned by anyone as one's own, and then offer them. So it's saying here, not only grasping at self uh, in a skillful way can be uh, a, a special method, you can also grasp at things that nobody in particular owns, like the state park, uh, like flowers growing uh, as you walk the neighborhood. You can, you can mentally own uh, all of this. But don't stop there, you know, don't just like, oh, which is, you know, I think I mentioned before, walking around the neighborhood, you know, uh, in the spring, it's like, oh, look at all these flowers. Like, so there I'm just grasping. <laughs> oh, so beautiful, you know. Before that grasping, I think uh, maybe my mindset is more like of unawareness even, just walking around you know, completely up in my head, maybe thinking about things, you know, not even, that's not so good. Next step is start paying attention. Ah, oh. and then at the beginning of paying attention might be, oh gosh, this house is ugly. Oh, that house is nice, right? But then at one point it's like, even the houses that I used to think, oh, the yard is really ugly. But instead of focusing on that, sometimes I started to focus on, Oh, how much the people that live there are comfortable with, you know, whatever messiness that I think is messy. And on some level, they're comfortable, you know, and the joy, right? Then I say, ah, oh, yeah, everyone has a home here, you know, and this little daffodil, you know, uh, I might think it's not placed in the right place, but, but whoever put it there, you know, probably gets pleasure from it. Then I think, oh, that is, so that's still grasping, you know. So the next level here uh, is that after you grasp that, right, then you offer them. So Bodhichaya Vatara says, if all that is not owned by anyone is grasped by the mind and correctly offered to the Supreme Sage and his sons, May the excellent ones worthy of offerings and endowed with great compassion regard me with love and accept these offerings of mine. This is in the second or the third chapter of Bodhicaya Vatara. It's part of the ritual of um, accumulating merit before receiving the Bodhisattva vows. So Shantideva says, you offer all the things that you can gather together physically, as much as you can. Then when you have exhausted that, then you have to gather with your mind all the things uh, that you cannot uh, uh, physically own, but you can mentally own them and then offer them. So then you say, well, isn't it better not to get attached at all? Actually here is saying, no, 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 that is not really non-attachment. That is just a blanking state of mind, oblivious. And that is a fundamental problem, lack of seeing. And then when we start seeing, at first it's critical seeing, huh? like dualistic seeing, oh, this is good, this is bad, this I like, this I don't like. Then you can progress to the next stage huh? and see beauty. Then beauty, yeah, don't get stuck there as mind. Progress to the next stage. Offer the beauty. Then next stage, yeah, offering the beauty, not just offering the beauty and the joy and the pleasure, but offering it with the hope, yeah, with the intention that the merit of this offering can be shared with those who have no capacity to enjoy right now. May they enjoy this. 
Ah, now, bodhicitta. Then in this way, it says, you can truly get beyond self-grasping and confusion. And furthermore, it is also like the story of King Prasenajit of Koshala and the female beggar. In brief, this is so because one must combine everything of samsara and nirvana within one's mind and offer it. That story uh, in uh, Sobish's uh, notes, it says, uh, Accordingly, a female beggar who watched the vast offerings brought and distributed to the Buddha and his monks by the servants of the king was deeply impressed by the king's insatiable desire for merit. She rejoiced in his merit, and the Buddha indicated while dedicating the merit that her merit was greater than that of the king. The connection of this story to the present Vajra statement is that by making the offering her own, through her rejoicing in the king's merit, she skillfully grasped a self with the goal of accumulating merit, or with the result of accumulating merit. I don't think she's there like calculating, you know, oh, right now I should, you know, grasp at the self so that I can offer this and I can, you know, get merit. But that she... Her mind was so broad. Sometimes, you know, when we are impoverished, you know, we are stuck in our state of impoverishment so that when we see people, other people making offerings, we use our little mind and judge them. Yeah. Show off. Yeah. He could give more, you know. Yeah. Or, or turn inwards, turn towards ourselves. Oh, poor me. Oh, pity me. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, 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 all of that. Then all of that, you know, it's adds to the suffering. <laughs> the causes of suffering increased. But if you know how to relate, you know, if you know how to, then you know, when you watch other people creating merit or enjoying their merit and you rejoice in that, Buddha says, you get everything that they get and on top of that, you get also the, the benefits of rejoicing in them. Sobishas notes to be truly able to abandon the self requires skill and discriminative knowledge supported by merit. Since the self has many subtle aspects, and anyways, this self doesn't exist, you know, doesn't truly exist. It's, it's, it's a mistaken uh, thing. It has many subtle aspects. These must first be clearly identified. This is an old notion in Buddhism, visible, for instance, in the Tibetan transmission of the discussion between the Indian master Kamala Shila and the Chinese master Hsiang Mahayan. Uh, so here Sobish is being careful. He says the Tibetan transmission of the discussion. Uh, so he knows that there are more research done now that says that this, this supposed exchange or debate between Kamala Shila and Hsiang never literally took place like this. But later Tibetan sources say, oh, these two masters had a debate because the king, King Tritsundesen, asked both of them to debate. This is according to Tibetan history, saying at one point the Dharma king of Tibet, Tritsundesen, asked the Indian Buddhist representative, represented by Kamala Shila, 
And the Chinese Buddhist representative, represented by this monk called He Shang Mo He Yan, yeah, to come together and debate. Yeah, because apparently they were teaching slightly different ways of approaching Buddhist practice. So the Tibetan king wanted to decide yeah, for the country of Tibet, which way should we follow? Then according to these, this story, the way the Tibetans tell this story, or the mainstream way of telling this story, Kamala Shila, the Indian side, won this. And Mohayan lost this. And the king says, from now on, uh, uh, only the Indian version should be taught in my land. And this other version, please leave. It says he banished them uh, back to China. Uh, but now there's a lot of um, research done to show uh, this story is a much later story. <laughs> First of all, these two men, these two masters, they never met face to face to debate. If anything, uh, the king did ask and they wrote uh, responses. Uh, then then the, the king. Uh, then there's also uh, evidence that showed that, uh, in fact, uh, the Chinese uh, Buddhist uh, tradition continued in Tibet. Because we have later uh, Chinese monks uh, working with Tibetans, translating sutras and texts into Tibetan. So that uh, the scenario. But anyway, the way Tibetan sources present this scenario, and the way the mainstream Tibetan sources present uh, this supposed debate uh, is what's uh, being repeated here. So Kamala Shila's principal criticism of Hersheng was the latter's inability to skillfully combine method and discriminative knowledge. He taught, according to the Tibetan tradition uh, that Hersheng taught, a dhyana practice, meaning a, a meditation practice of non-mentation. That means uh, not letting thoughts uh, proliferate, not letting thoughts continue on and on and on and on which he introduced to everyone as the abandonment of all practice and as a simple dwelling in non-thought and non-action. So Kamala Shila, the Indian master, instead explains that non-mentation does not mean mere absence of thoughts. Instead, it is non-objectifying or non-apprehension, which is only achievable by a person who carefully analyzes with discriminative knowledge. Thus, first one must correctly identify a thought or conception in one's co cognition, and after that, one may remove it through non-mentation. So this is uh, uh, Chodras, yeah? mm -hmm. kind of bringing in this as an example. Uh, not Chodra, uh, Sobish bringing is this, this debate uh, as a way to explain this statement. I, I don't know, uh, in my opinion, uh, if this is uh, you know, helpful or not. I don't know, maybe you think it's helpful. Mm. Mm. Uh, but uh, continuing, and this might be helpful. If a phenomenal sign should not be processed in mentation, meaning if a thought, a feeling uh, should not be processed, meaning like uh, encouraged uh, through more thoughts, more thinking, and then what should you do? Well, first of all, the mind has to identify it through analysis. And this is the Indian position through analysis. Following the identification, the fire of correct gnosis will consume the dichotomizing or the dualistic conception that processes such a mentation. As two sticks of wood rubbed together are consumed by the fire they produce. Thus, similarly to abandon the self, Discriminative knowledge is essential in order to identify all its subtle aspects, which presupposes skillful accumulations. So the initial grasping of a self to accumulate the necessary merit is therefore a skillful method through which the self 
and its analytical analytical thought eventually are self-consuming, like two sticks rubbed together. An image that is employed by Doja Sherab in this context. So by skillfully, uh, if you ask me again, I think this particular debate between Kamala Sheila and supposed debate between Kamala Sheila and Hershang maybe not not so useful uh, to to illuminate uh, this Vajra statement. Uh, anyway, questions, comments? I think just Chodrak's commentary. You know, Question. Just, yes. Uh -huh. uh, does this also refer to the idea that if you don't have the idea of a self, you don't have the idea of a non-self either? It's like... And so therefore... Not, not, well, therefore, if you if you can't understand the idea of a self, you can't get to the idea, even intellectually, of a non-self. Like the if if you if you have a cup, it's a cup. Mm -hmm. But the but you can only contrast that with the idea of not cup. It's or rather, the idea of not cup, uh, I think what you're saying is the other way around. The idea of a non-cup is dependent on first having an idea having of a, a cup. Having a cup, right. Yeah. That's, that's right. You, that could say, you could say this is going on here, but then not exactly. Because... If you truly did not have the concept of a self, like Buddhists do not have a concept of self, then you don't even need to talk about non-self. But we're not there yet, so you have to... Yeah, so the, the, the more important point here is, you think you don't have a concept of self. But we do. But that is not true. It's not that you don't have a concept of self. That's the point about aimlessly. That's that's Chodra, you know. Aimlessly not, not grasping any phenomenon as self is an aspect of delusion. So what he's saying there is, it might look as if you don't have a concept of self. By kind of walking around in this, you know, dissociated <laughs> maybe you know like uh, I, I'm not attached to anything I, I, I don't care about anything actually self-grasping is there it's just not clear so the point here is to recognize that despite what we may think we do, well, we that is grasping. that is the that is the logic that then takes us to the point being made here. The point being made here is about how you can accumulate merit by recognizing by grasping self. by by deliberately grasping self. No, no, no. The the grasping of the self. The the point of like. Uh, you think you are not grasping at the self, but you are, in fact, and so therefore uh, recognize that. That becomes the basis for this statement. This statement is not about that. The statement is based on that. The statement wants to say, in order to get out of samsara, you have to skillfully use this grasping problem. So recognize it and use it properly. Yes. Recognize and use it properly. 
Yeah, th this is what what we talked about is more, uh, or what you just said is like uh, the first recognition, yeah? and having recognized that, therefore, what do you do now? Know that yeah? the way to get beyond self grasping is not to superficially abandon self grasping, but to work with it. To me, this is also a, a kind of like a, a, an ancient statement to address the problem of what now people have become kind of a, I don't know, I don't see so many uh, essays or, you know, things, but uh, a few years back, you see a lot, you know, this whole thing about spiritual bypassing, the dangers of spiritual bypassing. So, so this is related to that. using a sense of like, oh, I'm spiritual, I'm a Dharma practitioner, to not, right? See that, you know, <laughs> you're quite a mess, you know, and not wanting to deal with these, these uh, behavioral problems and afflictive emotions. So, and, and then beyond that, this statement is saying, when you recognize that, then uh, even what is uh, at the root identified as at the root of the problem, that can be used and has to be, not just can, in fact, has to be used uh, to overcome. So another, sometimes another analogy they give is that uh, uh, when you have a splinter lodge uh, in your, you know, uh, finger, so to say, you need another splinter, uh, another sharp thing uh, to pull it out. And so likewise, so another analogy they say is like, when you have fallen onto the ground, right? So when you fall on the ground, uh, then, then of course, when your body hits the ground, uh, the direct cause of the pain is the ground, right? when the body hits the ground right, because you have fallen, then the direct cause of pain is your body hitting against the ground. But to get up from the ground, you need to rely on the ground, push up against the ground to get up. So likewise, although self-grasping is ultimately the cause of wandering in samsara, you do not get beyond self-grasping by... Mm, superficially uh, by seemingly uh, saying, oh, I don't want to grasp anymore. In fact, the path consists of skillfully choosing what to grasp and what not to grasp. Uh, what are healthy attachments uh, given the situation that we are in? And then moving on, uh, then giving up those attachments, uh, then uh, the next set of attachments, so to say, and gradually refine and train ourselves. Twenty-three, twenty-four. The last two statements have to do with dedicating merit. Twenty-three. Uh, there is a whole section where Chodra is busy uh, refuting uh, Sakya Pandita and Sakya Pandita's uh, disciples. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if we need to go into all of that. Uh, uh, your second reading of Gongchik, you can go back to see uh, what quarrels. Uh, Chodra is trying to settle uh, with the Sakyapas. <laughs> uh, this first reading, I think uh, we, we might get carried away, you know, if we uh, try to go too deep into uh, that. But, but we will look at the section of Statement 23, the, the commentary uh, that is just purely about what Kyopar Rinpoche is trying to communicate uh, rather than uh, defending Kyopar Rinpoche a few centuries later. 
uh, then 24. Uh, so 23 and 24, uh, they are uh, very uh, important points uh, with regards to the practice of dedicating uh, merit. Mm -hmm. So 23, you see, it says the root of the virtue of all of samsara and nirvana is dedicated. Then 24 is like, uh, it is also necessary to perform dedications to the Buddhas and Gurus. And this is like a really like, what? Really? It says you need to dedicate merit even to Buddhas and to uh, your Guru. Normally we think, you know, oh, they are perfected. Or at least you're supposed to view your guru uh, as perfected, Buddha-like. Then, do we still need to offer merit to them? According to Kyopa Rinpoche, yes. And it's like, oh, wow. What does that mean? Yeah, so we'll, we'll look at that. And with that, we finish this chapter uh, on the uh, training of the Bodhisattva, chapter 4. Then we have chapter 5. And then we have chapter 7. Now 6 we have already done. Now chapter 5 is longer. It has 28 statements. Yeah, uh, chapter 5, it's on the the third of the three sets of vows, eh? the Vajrayana, chapter 5. Then, uh, chapter 7, the resultant state of Buddhahood. Then there is an appendix, a supplement chapter, which is all the statements that uh, I think uh, Sherab Jungne decided is uh, kind of repetitive. Yeah, So he, 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 he put down, he, he, he gathered together all these evocative statements that he remembered hearing Kyoba Rinpoche say. So uh, there's 190-ish, depending on different versions of early Gongche commentaries, but more or less 190 statements distributed over seven chapters. Then there is 46, I believe, was it 48? Uh, then there's like 46, uh, I think, statements, uh, 48 statements. Oh, here is 47. I'm, I've seen somewhere 46 uh, in the supplement uh, chapter, which, which Sherab Jungne feels that, okay, uh, those 190 plus minus in the seven chapters, they are, good, they are you know, they, 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 they are good there. Then these 47, I should put as an appendix yeah, because they repeat. Yeah. But nonetheless, they are, you know, important, evocative Vajra statements. Yeah. So those 47 are not organized in any particular form, uh, in any particular uh, kind of organization, except that they are all, uh, it's almost like, you know, like you 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 write an important thing and then, yeah, the editor comes, you know, which is yourself, and say, okay, all these things I, 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 I can take out uh, because it's just repeating what has been said. But I don't want to throw them away. And, and luckily, he did not throw them away. Uh, these are statements uh, that are also very meaningful. Yeah, so that's in uh, chapter 8. But the main chapters are the seven chapters. <clears throat> So tonight there is uh, Dugong Dhamma Kirti Sangha meeting, uh, New York time. We start from seven to nine. Chang Chu Sem Chu Rim Pu Chi Ma Ke Pa Nam Ke Gyu Chi Ke Pa Nyam Pa Me Pa Okay, have a good day, and we'll see you all either tonight or on Friday. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye, bye. Gracias.